Let's be seated, everybody. God is good. Amen. Thank God for thank God for yet another time of sweet fellowship. I just want to thank God for Bennett. Yeah, praise God. Um, you know, God said to me, just do it. Because I saw myself standing here and thanking God for Bennett. And I was like, uh, why though? He said, just do it. Because sometimes we want to know everything before we do everything. You see what I mean? But sometimes you just have to learn how to obey and do. And in the process of doing, you get to know when it is all done. And so I'm moving by faith today to say thank God for Bennett. I don't know what it is, but as I stood there, that was what I saw. And so once it gets manifest, I think we will all be able to say, indeed, the word of the Lord came forth. Praise the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. We're going to talk about baptisms in just a little bit, but I can see that every single person who is lined up to be baptized on Tuesday, uh, none of them is here. I know Dion, that she's out of town. Um, I think Shannon, too, is getting baptized, or so she's not here. Tia is not here, not this Tia, the other Tia. And so if you know anyone else who is getting baptized on Tuesday, uh, please remind them that it is this coming Tuesday. Because we we're hoping to give a reminder to them today, but they are not here as it is. And, um, but then again, yeah, as it is our custom, we lift up those who aren't with us in prayers because of, it could be due to one reason or the other that they're not here. Some of the ones that we don't see, but the ones that I just mentioned, I think I know they're out of town. God is good. Now, I want to touch on two things. My wife came up here, and I think she read Revelation chapter 3 verse 8. Alan came and read Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. And while he was reading Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, I remember a dream that Shayla shared with me a couple of months ago. It might have been about two months ago, and it was from Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. And I'm like, okay, what is going on in here? I think we need to kick off by touching on what's really the deal and what we need to start to draw from these three verses of Scripture. We will read them again. Emmanuel, whatever you've done is fantastic. I love it. Let's just keep it like that. Well done. God is good. All righty. I'm excited to see uh, some folks that I haven't seen in a while. Justin and the family, good to see y'all. Praise the Lord. My friend Diana, good to see you too. Oh, yeah. Um, even though I said I was expecting to see your husband more than I was expecting to see you, the reality of it is, like I told my wife, I've pretty much seen you here every day for like a week straight. And interestingly, going back to the visions, it was just you. So I know that God has a reason, and he has something that he is up to. Today marks exactly three years that Papa started coming to Communion House, and we just thank God for your life. That is Greg McLean, Alan's daddy. Good to see you, Brother Greg. Good to, good to, good to have you here. And you know, the thing is, when he was reminding me, it was with so much joy. And that was the second confirmation that I needed that today I need to speak about what the Lord has been doing that we have seen or the things that the Lord has done that we have seen. I, it, it did occur to me, maybe yesterday or earlier today, that it is important for us to not forget his benefits and to actually enumerate and to itemize as much as we can the things that God is doing in our midst. But then again, even though I may have forgotten the Lord has instrumented for me to remember by allowing my wife to mention it here. She said, Kayla has been here now for about a year, and in that one year, she's had two promotions. And they're not just two promotions. In fact, they feel like four, because one of them is like a double, if not a triple promotion. And, um, and when my wife said that, she didn't stop at that. She did say, we need to thank God for the understanding that we have of the word of God now that we probably didn't have a year ago. You understand what I mean? And I smiled where I was because when the Holy Spirit brought that thought to my attention, I just started to see certain people like on a roller deck just go past me, uh, just, just go um, in a vision in front of me, one face after the other, and I was just thanking God for how far they have come. And so we're going to talk on that also today because I give God thanks in my heart for folks who would come to me now with a dream from God and they're not panicking nor sounding confused 
but convicted and clear. You understand what I mean? You know, because it takes spiritual maturity to be able to receive a dream from God, and rather than being afraid and confused, you, you come with conviction. Like, okay, this is why God gave me this dream. He's convicting me because of this that I need to grow in, and then they have clarity on exactly what to do next. That, to me, is more precious than if every single one of us had played the lottery by laying hands on the ticket and won a million dollars each. Because these material things, uh, the Bible says wealth, riches, they will develop wings and fly away. But when we talk about spiritual maturity and developing stamina in the grace of God, we're talking about things that are of eternal value. We're talking about the fact that some people who used to, uh, who would fall asleep 30 minutes into my teaching, will be asking for more after 90 minutes. And it's not because I got better at preaching, it's just because they got more attentive and got more interested in listening to the Word of God. Stop looking around now. Come on, look, let's look here. Because I, I see you be looking at people who used to, uh, yeah, after 30 minutes, they will be like, uh, when are we leaving? Um, you know, they go to the bathroom like three or four times and the fifth time they don't come back inside. But what we have seen, like Jesus said, is blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know, because at the end of the day, I mean, we, we thank God, but then, also, but then also we cannot take credit. Simply because when 2020 came and the world was shaken up as it was, it, it caused for many of us to wake up to the reality of the things that are important. You know, the Bible says the kingdom of God is not in meat, it is not in drink, but it is in righteousness, peace, and joy. The true riches that we are supposed to pursue in this dimension while we await the next constitute those three things, righteousness, peace, and joy. And so I want to encourage you to continue to pursue earnestly the things that are of eternal value. Continue to seek to understand more the things that have been written for your sake. Continue to seek to walk more in the Spirit and to manifest the fruits of the Spirit. Let us seek to be more long-suffering. Let us endeavor to be more patient and kind. You know, because there are times wherein the lack of result on the outside in the areas of man's recognition causes us every now and again to fall short of thanksgiving for the things that God is doing that is uh, that, 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 that make for the progress of our spirits and the progress of our walk with God. Let me say all of that again slowly. You see, sometimes because men have identified, or people and the world in general, uh, have identified certain things as the all marks or the yardsticks for success. We have come to focus so much on those things that even when heaven is doing a work on the inside of us, we, we tend not to recognize it as much as we should. We tend to kind of downplay the things that God brings our way to lift us up so we can stand in the company of innumerable angels, so that we can take our places in the company of just men made perfect, so that we can be dear children of God who are able to withstand every fiery dart of Satan. And on Tuesday, I believe it was, I read to us the account of Jesus speaking concerning, concerning eunuchs, saying certain eunuchs are born that way. To be a eunuch means to be one whose ability to produce has been terminated, cut off, or just non-existent. And so Jesus has some people, so basically there are no more children in here, so basically it's the word to be castrated. And so Jesus says some people are born that way. They're just born without being able to produce in that area. Some people were made so by man, in, incapacitated by man, whereas others choose to be like that for the sake of the kingdom. And I reminded us that some of us, we have identified or we may have identified areas in our lives wherein we have not been fruitful. And rather than getting hung up on those things, we need to seek the Lord and recognize if that is indeed the will of God for us so that we might be able to grow in other areas. And so we should learn to see the significance of being fruitful in the spirit and make sure that we always prioritize that over being fruitful in the natural. Simply because the things of the natural 
are not eternal. They are mostly temporal. And so I want you to do a reflection right now, wherever you might be, and give thanks to God for how far he has brought you. You remember, I think it was a week ago now, or maybe, maybe two weeks ago, when I came up here and the Holy Spirit said to ask you, how did I get here? For you to ask yourself, how did I get here? And we saw what happened and how that just started to stir up gratitude on the inside of us for the fulfillment of the promise that God made to you and I that he will lead us by his Holy Spirit. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by God. As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons and daughters of God. And so when God leads us, he doesn't just lead us so that we can say that, yeah, God is leading me. He leads you on to profit. So you can see measurable progress. You can see tangible results of the divine placement and positioning by God. I believe that I have the okay. In fact, I know that I have the okay by God to call out a couple of names. To throw light on some people. You know, in the world, they throw shade, but here we throw light. Even though sometimes it may sound like we be throwing shade here. But no, every rebuke is out of love just so that you can become thoroughly furnished unto every good work. I'm going to first of all call on my wife. You know, my wife is someone, and you know, you know, I told you some of us when we got married, we were rough around the edges. That couldn't be said about me because I was rough in and out not just around the edges. I was as rugged as they come. On the outside, I looked very sophisticated, well-packaged. But they, on the inside, on some days, I was a disaster going somewhere to happen. But by the grace of God, the Lord continued being the potter that he is to mold and to make me, even though there were times when I was almost not makeable, he had to break me so that he can remake me. But I know that my wife, she, that description would be more for someone like my wife who was just slightly rough around certain edges. But over time, not only have those edges become smooth, just like the Lord says that the crooked, it will make straight. But I have also seen my wife become a pillar. I've seen her become a warrior. I've seen her become an angel in my life and in the lives of many people. You see, the work of God here at Communion House has already yielded things that are of eternal value, that only eternity can measure. And so I just want to thank God for your life. Thank God for the intercessor that you are. Thank God for the warrior that you have become. And you see, we do not take these things for granted simply because there are many people out there who have understood the science of accolade and they have come to master the sociology of reward, of award. And what I mean by that is they have come to know the things that other people are looking for. So once they attain those, people start to give them accolade. Jesus says they have their reward. Some people have come to know what boxes they need to check to be given awards by men to say, oh, 50 under 50, 20 under 20. But then at the end of the day, there are not many things in this life as foolish as living your life like that. Simply because men that you are trying to impress and perform to were not the ones who made you, neither were they the ones who, have an, who designed your life. They also are supposed to be living their lives to please God rather than promoting themselves to a place wherein they can give an approval to somebody else. Do you know that a lot of people, what gives them aggrandizement or the kind of aggrandizement that gives them confidence comes from people who have no business giving com commendation. You know, people, I mean, it happens a lot on social media. On so social media, people come up with all kinds of prophecies, they come up with all kinds of words of encouragement, they come up with all kinds of motivational uh, charge, and then you see people in the comment section saying, wow, in all of our lives, we haven't seen a man of God like you. They will say things like, oh, prophesy, oh, papa, you know, all of those things. And I'm like, the person that is giving you commendation did not even come here for Jesus, they came for things. 
And so why would you base your accomplishment or your drive on idol worshipers? Because some people have completely neglected the responsibility they have toward God to worship God. They have chosen to worship men because that is the way of the world. Especially in the times that we live in, we live in this celebrity culture that is just a nice name for idolatry, wherein people will follow celebrities to hell. You ask people, why are you doing that? Oh, this person does it. And I'm like, yeah, no, but why are you doing it? You're doing it because they do it or because they endorsed it or because they approve of it. I heard this morning that somebody unfollowed Manuelina on Facebook because she was talking too much against believers who are going for Christians organized by the occult. You know, because we have a lot of the most, let me just put it this way, without any fear of contradiction. Most of the most promoted concerts, whether gospel or secular, that are on social media are not of God. Okay, let's just, um, yeah. Let me, let, me, let me tell you, you see, I, I like to say things like this because whether you accept them as the truth now or not, it doesn't change anything. Very soon you will see it. I've lived long enough to understand the place of prophecy. I've lived long enough to understand that the word of God is yesterday the same today and forevermore. And so I tell you that if you see the world pushing anything, it's not of God. Because friendship with the world is enmity against God. It doesn't matter how many titles that person has against their name. It doesn't matter how many souls are on their website that they claimed to have saved. The world only looks after itself. Jesus says, if they're not for you, they are against you. You understand what I mean? And so when you look at the, 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 the rate at which people do things just because they want to identify or associate with one celebrity or the other, it becomes very apparent that we are once again awaiting God's visitation because men have gotten Aaron to make them an idol of gold once again. Let me say that slowly. You see, when people come together and they get those who are supposed to be priests, who are anointed by God, and they get them to make for themselves a golden calf, it is one of the final signs before the judgment of God comes. Now, for us, the judgment of God does not bring us fear because the judgment that we're anticipating has a name. And what is it called? It's called redemption. You see, because we have already been justified in Christ Jesus. So when God comes, when he comes appearing in the skies, he's coming for our redemption. Okay, so when you hear judgment of God, don't be afraid. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, that the one who is afraid is the one in whom the love of God is not yet made perfect. Because perfect love casts away every fear. So when we're talking about judgment, we're not talking about judgment so that you can go to one corner and start confessing all of your sins. God already says your sins I do not remember. He says I do not even register anything against you. As far as the east is from the west, have I removed your sins away from you? So judgment does not drive us to fear. It gives us a holy expectation of redemption. Alrighty, praise the Lord. And so here is the deal. No, First John chapter 3, verse 8. 4, verse 8 is what you have on the board that says, he that does not love does not know God because God is love. But when you look at 3, verse 8, that's where you find, uh, what's that scripture again? That perfect love casts away. Is he 417? Okay, well, let's listen to Manuel Lida. She read her Bible before coming. Say that again. First John what? Okay, both of them are guessing. I was just commending my wife, but now she's guessing. I don't know what that is about, but let's keep going anyway. Let me find you that, that scripture because it is an important one for us to meditate on, especially after the series of scriptures. It's 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. 1 John 4, 18. Manuel Lida, not 17, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. But let's go back to what I was saying with regards to idolatry. I'm going to call out a couple of things today simply because we are in the final stages of our readiness for those boxes that we're unveiling. 
You know, the Lord's raised Alan amongst us as a seer, a watchman upon the tower. And every now and again, the Lord will reveal these things. And I have come to celebrate them and not to take them lightly at all, simply because the Bible says he has given these gifts unto men for the edification of the body and for the perfecting of the saints. When God raises people amongst us and they begin to show all of these things, I don't take them for granted at all. I, I celebrate the gifts and I encourage the people that are already walking in their gifts because to, when we are faithful in little, God gives us more. When we have learned to be thankful for the little, God does what? He gives us more. And so that's just another way of giving a shout out to Alan. God bless you. Thank God for your obedience. Thank God for your growth. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to call out some other seers in this place. I want to showcase some of the seers that God has given to us here so that you can bother them as the Spirit leads. Okay? So you can go to them and say, what is the Lord showing you? You know, my leader is a seer. And I thank God for the record that she has borne amongst us of seeing things. You know, whenever Manuel Lida comes and she has a dream and it has to do with anything in government, I take it very seriously because God's really used her greatly in that capacity of being able to see things that are going on in the world government. You understand what I mean? You know, someone like Kayla, Kayla sees things that have to do with individual progress. I'm not sure if you've noticed that a lot of the dreams and visions and trances that she sees, they've got to do with us understanding how to comport ourselves in the realm of the spirit. They've got to do without to recognize what the angel of the Lord is doing in the lives of our children so that we can take the right posture as individuals that are called by God and given a rest responsibility for the furtherance of the kingdom. And so I, I, I salute you too. also continue to grow in your giftings in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, praise the Lord. Let us go to Revelations chapter 3. Revelations chapter 3 verse 8. I know we read it already today while my wife was up here, but we're going to read it again shortly. Just one more time. God is good. So, the book of Revelations, chapter 3, verse 8. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Verse 9, if I let me just quickly say something about not denying the name of God. On Tuesday, we talked about the fact that you're supposed to give thanks to God because his name is your testimony. Remember that the name of the Lord is your testimony because the children of Israel, they would call the name of God, they would call him Yeshua, which means God our salvation. He, they, they didn't just say thank you for saving us from this and saving us from that. They just say thank you because of your name. Because no matter what happens, the name of the Lord stays the same and it holds true. And the reason why it is important for us to learn how to give God thanks for his name as opposed to the things that we receive is so that when you get to situations that appear to be wilderness, wherein you are not receiving all of the things that you have petitioned of the Lord, you will still be able to praise him because even though your situation may be changing from time to time, his name never changes. He remains faithful. You see, if we don't know how to give God thanks for his name as the healer, when we pray for that headache to go and it doesn't immediately go, we cannot be thankful because we have only associated thanksgiving with happenings. And so when things haven't happened, you don't praise God. But when you praise God because of who he is and because of his name, even when that head is still banging, you're still thanking him because he is the healer. And that is what guarantees that ultimately you will have a testimony. Praise the Lord. And so to deny his name 
is to sometimes live as though God has stopped being the provider. To deny his name is to live your life and to allow and, and to entertain thoughts that make it seem like your heavenly father is no longer the healer. That your heavenly father is no longer your salvation. You know, there are certain times wherein the devil will beat us up because of all the things that we're not doing right, because of all of our shortcomings, so that we can be of that mindset like the Galatians that, oh, because I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I cannot expect good, I, have to, I, I only can expect expect punishment and reprimand and it is an indication that somewhere in our hearts we are denying that God is the savior because if I know that my salvation is of God I will not beat myself up for the things that I'm not doing well enough or for the things that I am overdoing I will remain confident in him and once his love is being made perfect in me those shortcomings will be remediated because the valleys are his to fill and the mountains are his to bring low. If I try to fill all the valleys and try to lower all the mountains, when will I get to enjoy all of what he's done? Because Satan knows that he cannot undo what Jesus did and so he would rather keep you busy so that you're too occupied to enjoy it. You know, if I pay all of Ade's debt, and I'm not saying that he has debt, I'm just using him as an example. If I pay all his debt and he is unaware of it, he will still walk around as a borrower. He may still struggle. And so if his enemies don't want him to be free, they will continue to remind him of his debt rather than him knowing that his debts are paid so that he can live free. And that is the reason why Satan tries to occupy us with things that we do all in the name of receiving God's commendation or approval. I want you to say, like Paul said, I am accepted in the beloved. Your heavenly father and mine has already accepted you. Like I told you on Tuesday, we are not looking to be approved. We have already been approved. Now we're waiting to be improved. You see, I have already been approved by God because I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And it is believing in that truth or belief in that truth is what actually then begins the work of transformation. Because we get in the way of our own transformation because we just don't believe that we, we are worthy of all the things that God has said concerning us in his word. We just don't believe that, you know, God is enough to save us and to bless us. We, we are too focused on our contribution, whereas he says only believe. And so we cannot continue to deny his name. Verse 9 is the vision that Shayla shared with me. She says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. There are people going around in the world today in millions and tens of millions who claim to be Jews, but who are not Jews. Jesus warned us. He says they will come. He says many will come in my name. He says, but by their fruits, we shall know them. When the Pharisees came to Jesus, Jesus knew that the camp of Israel had already been infiltrated by implants of Satan who are not the seed of Abraham. They wore the uniform. They had learned to speak. They, they, they used the right vocabulary. Some of them had even gone ahead to obtain titles and high places for themselves in the synagogue. And they would parade themselves in their long garment, fulfilling all of the traditions of men, receiving all of the accolades and the awards of men. But Jesus was not about to be mocked by all of their philandering. He was not about to be confused. He says, you claim to be of Abraham. He says, but I know who you are. You are of your father, the devil. He said, because you are liars and sons of Satan, who is the father of lies. Jesus experienced that in his ministry. And nobody else except for Jesus and John the Baptist had the insight by God to call out those people for not truly being seeds of Abraham. And you know the reason why? 
because most of the others were in the flesh. And in the flesh, those people looked like they were the righteous people because the system that they were operating in and operating under was masterminded by the prince of deception. And so there was a way that Satan had construed the structure of that society such that anyone that is in the flesh will remain servitude to the dictates of Lucifer. And that is the reason why we cannot be in the flesh. Cody, if we are in the flesh, we will give approval to people that are messengers of Satan. Because they will come disguised as angels of light. If we are in the flesh, we will cast our votes and put our support behind those who actually are only putting up a mask of humanity. The reality is if you have the right discernment, you will see that they're not even from here. They came from the corridors of hell. But being in the flesh is so easy and so convenient that many of us would rather remain at the foot of the mountain than take time to climb to the top. You see, because at the bottom of the mountain, anything goes. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry can say that they are who they are not. But Jesus warned us. He says, they will come. He said, but you can tell who they are by the fruits that they bear. Anyone who is bearing fruits of exploitation is not of Christ. They come. And so in the vision that God showed to um, Shayla, she saw us in a building wherein provision had been made for the sustenance of the saints. There were, there were rooms full of beds and supplies indicative of the fact that no matter what happens in the world, we have already been provided for. You see, because the Bible says, only with our eyes shall we behold the reward of the wicked. We are in Goshen. We are concentrated unto the Lord. It doesn't matter how boisterous the angel of death gets. It doesn't come where we're at because we're behind the blood. You understand what I mean? She said, but while we were there, they came and she recognized them to be of the sect of those who claim to be Jews. But we know that they are of the synagogue of Satan because all they do is kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus says one of the ways by which you will know them is that they always lie. Before he went to the cross, that was what he said to the Pharisees. He says, you're a brood of vipers. You are of your father, the devil, who is the father of lies. And what did he say again? This is the retro resurrected Jesus that appeared to John on the island of Patmos. He said the same thing to him. He could have warned him of everything else, but he chose to warn him in particular of their lies. He says they, they, they lie. They are not of God. Why is it important for us to know these things? You see, Jesus says they will come and they will worship at your feet. I want you to think about that for a second. Think about all the things that have to be in place for these warmongers to come and worship at your feet. They will not worship at your feet if they still think they're the ones on top and you are beneath. So for them to come and worship at your feet means that the Lord would elevate you and that the crown of glory will be seen on you and that you will be positioned by God to be seen as royalty. I'm going to take my time and I'm going to use a couple of examples. Remember Solomon. Why did Sheba come to worship? Because she heard of the glory. And all the kings that were around, they would come and pay obeisance to Solomon. The Bible says in Isaiah that arise and shine for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Gentiles will come to your light and kings 
to the brightness of your shining. Communion house and friends, I say to you today that the ones of the synagogue of Satan who are in charge of the money, the one of the synagogue of Satan who are the princes of the air, the ones who are of the synagogue of Satan who have continued to seek to exploit the weak and to oppress the fatherless are about to bow at your feet. Now, this promise is only for the children of God. This is not for people who have heard about us, but it is for people who have come to be one of us. And to be one of us means to be an heir of salvation together with Christ Jesus. It has to be, you have to be one who believes in the Son of God. Like John chapter 1 verse 12 says, For as many as have received him, even to those who believe on his name, have we given the power to be called the sons of God. And so if you happen to stumble on this video on YouTube or Facebook, and you like what you're hearing because you can't wait for those of the synagogue of Satan to close shop and come and bow at your feet, I want you to ask yourself this question, am I a child of God? Do I believe on his name or do I believe in my own abilities? Do I believe on his name or do I believe in the name of that celebrity politician? Do I believe that only Christ can save or have I elevated another man to the position of Christ? Do I speak dial with my mouth by saying, oh, if only this person was in government, oh, things would not be like this. Do, do, do I say that the problem that I am going through is because this person is in office or because that person is my neighbor? Am I pointing to flesh and blood or have I come to realize that my making and my breaking is only in the hand of the one who is called the lover of my soul? Do you believe on his name? You see, because at the end of the day, we were raised to have a place for religion in our hearts. But at the end of the day, that place that religion has so long occupied is meant not for the rites and the rituals approved by men, but it is meant only for confidence and trust in the Almighty God. It is high time we choose whether we believe or we don't. It is high time we chose to believe in his name. Verse 10 says, because you have kept my word, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. If you didn't, if you haven't listened to Tuesday's message, Tuesday's message is gold. Oh, yes. Yes. And I can say that because we're not selling it, it's free. So I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to make money. It's gold. And the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be established. Chris was in here. Even though I kept, I thought he was here because I was like, man, when I was preaching, I thought I saw you. No, he said I wasn't. But he listened to it and he told me that Tuesday's message is gold. And do you know one of the things that I love about Tuesday's message was how the Holy Spirit took us on a recap of the prophecies dating back to 2015, which were the revelations of what will happen after COVID. And it took us to 2018, which was a clear picture of what COVID was going to be. And through 2020, January, March, before the, um, uh, the emergency medical procedure and the lockdown and all of those things. So all of that in one message. If you ever said thank you, Jesus, in a while, this is a good time to say it. Because I tell you what, you can just go back to that message and listen again because I took us through the progression. And then I went and thank God for Alan who was able to find us the image of the beast that was presented late 2021, right? And I took us through that again and showed us the meaning of the of, of, of the. Of the of the statue that was brought from Mexico by the couple whose names meant messengers of God. Both of them, their names mean messenger. 
in different languages. And, and how God took that as an opportunity to point our attention to the verse of scripture that is written on the United Nations building at the Rockefeller Center that says wisdom shall be the stability of your time. And I took you through how God raised me up around that time to notify you that a war was coming. November, December, I kept screaming, a war is coming and it's gonna be the war of kings. And January 2022, just a month later, Six weeks to be precise. The Lord prepared us. He gave us six weeks notice. The war broke out in Ukraine, the middle ground, and that war is being fought by the Volodymyrs because their name both means ruler of the world. Just as the Lord prophesied. You see, when God does a thing like that, it's because he's letting you know that time is short and he's giving you kind of like a cheat sheet. Someone here wrote an exam a while ago and he failed. It didn't pass. Let's not use the word fail. That's too strong. He didn't pass the exam. And I said to him, how come you didn't pass the exam? Did you not look for the cheat sheet that I told you about? He was like, oh, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to study and prepare on my own. And I'm like, where is the result of your preparation? And I told him, I said, I know the nature of the exam that you were to write. The nature of the exam is such that there is, you need to consume a huge volume of work to be able to pass that exam if you want to take that route. That was why I told you to go and find dumps because they are past questions and answers. They are summarized. It's a little diet that can prepare you for the exam. That was what we got on Tuesday. Tuesday was a dump. It was a diet of the things that we need to know because the examiners have left heaven. The inhabitants of the earth are about to be tested. I'm sorry if I do not have any tips for you on how to get promoted at your job, but today I have tips for you on how to be promoted from the mundane into the eternal. Simply because there is a test and it is coming upon all those who do well upon the earth. I've been saying this for a while, and I am not tired of saying it simply because many of us need to wake up from being fixated on the things of the world. Jesus says, whosoever believes in him, the only begotten son will not perish, but have life eternal. Why did he say you will not perish? Because the world is perishing. It's a sinking ship and the only way to make it out of a sinking ship is not to try to lift the ship by yourself is to take the help that is available someone is sending you a lifeline take it let him save you do you know when the word of the lord came to mary and joseph the angel of the lord says and you shall call his name yeshua because he will save his people. If you can save yourselves, I know how much you care about yourself. You would have saved yourself a long time ago. But you cannot. He alone can save. The Bible says there is no other name under the heavens that has been given unto men by which we might be saved except the name of Jesus, the anointed one. So one of the things that I am here to announce to you again today is that the real focus is on saving your soul. The Bible says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What is this soul that you need to save? Your soul before the Lord is a name. Your soul and my soul, no matter how anointed you are, no matter how colorful your ministry is, no matter how obedient you are to the calling, no matter how much fruit you bear, your soul is represented before your heavenly father as just a name. So when the Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What it means is what is it to you if your heavenly father does not know your name? Jesus says to those ones who came introducing themselves with business cards of gold, saying, Jesus, in case you forgot who we are, we were the crusaders. 
We were the miracle walkers. You know, there's a movie out there now called Miracle Walkers. Yeah. That is the order of those who will perish. Because they came to Jesus saying, we did miracles in your name. And Jesus was like, but I, I, I do not know you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Now, I'm giving you another diet here. This is, I'm referring to a message that I preached in July. Might have been early August. I started it in July, continued in early August. I don't remember the title now. But I told you that God knows you only if you trust him. For the Bible says he knows the ones who put their trust in him. He knows their name. And so you, he knows your name if you call his name. That is the reason why Jesus says, in that day, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is what the Lord is doing on the day. He is walking by and his reward is with him. And when you say, Jesus, oh Moses, and then he will call your name. That is love being made perfect. But then those who do not call his name, he doesn't get to call their name. And if he doesn't call your name, your soul is not recognized as precious. And so whatever is coming to sweep the world will sweep away every nameless so, the Bible says those whose names were no longer found in the Lamb's book of life will be washed away to perish in the lake of fire. Again, there is no torment if you truly know that he loves you and that you love him. This will not come to you as torment. If anything at all, it's going to be a thing of joy because for you he comes and his reward is with him for you. So my question to you again, not the people here, because I know the people here are born again, spirit filled, they love Jesus, but to you who may stumble upon this video, when was the last time you called, called his name? Is he the one that you call when you are in trouble or is it your bank? Is he the one you call when you are in trouble or do you keep summoning powers from within you because someone told you that you're a God? You know, because the new age tells us that we are gods. And I'm like, wow. We have so diminished what it means to be a God. You know, they tell you that, oh, we are all gods. Have you, has anyone heard that of late? When they said, oh, everything. In fact, people are preaching it from the pulpit, telling you that, oh, from time immemorial, everything was on the inside of you. So if everything that I need has always been inside of me, then why did I need to be born again? Why do I need to be a new creation in Christ Jesus? If that old man was sufficient. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. My old man was crucified with Christ. I do not lay hold of anything that was in that old man because it was made corrupt in Adam. But I am made anew in the second and in the last Adam. And so we need to recognize that our sufficiency is not of ourselves, but it is of him. And so again, there is a test that is coming. And it is a test to prove whether you will trust him and call him or whether you will trust the system and call the system. See, because the reality of it is there are two groups of people that are on earth right now. The wheat and the tears. The wheat have to make themselves distinct. And when 2020 came, one of the things that I told you was that the Lord revealed to me that it was a time of separation. It was a time of choosing the ones who are on the Lord's side and the ones who were not. And since that time, we have started counting the days because the Bible says that process will take place for two days and on the third day, he will come for his people. He says, in two days, I'll prepare my people and on the third, I will return for them. And so we know that we have come to, we are, we are right now at the precipice, the cusp of the visitation. Well, not visitation, it's a return because Jesus is not visiting. He's coming back. The Bible says where the body is, there the eagles will gather. It will be a fulfillment of the promise of the Lord to his people saying that the Lord will make his abode with the children of man from eternity to eternity. So one of the things that I'm going to share with us, one more thing rather before we go on is this. The significance of paying attention to the fact that they're coming to worship at your feet is very great. 
Let's take Solomon as an example again. The Bible says Solomon asked of the Lord to give him wisdom. And with that wisdom, it became so distinct, so unique, that others came to worship at his feet. But do you know one more thing about the man Solomon that makes it very critical when we're studying his life and ministry to pay attention to his own name? His name means peace. Solomon, Shalom. In the times that we're living in, you have to be a person of peace. Stop fighting on social media. Stop, being, stop getting troubled by the fluctuations in the stock market. Let nothing trouble your heart. One of the manifestations of the wisdom of God is the presence of peace. I say that because these messengers of the synagogue of Satan, they will not worship at your feet if you do not know that you are royalty. And if you are royalty, you will be at peace because all things have been brought under your feet in Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to explain that in another way. God told us about two years ago, he said, I don't want you found on the streets, running and looking for help. Running the Elta Skelter. I want you to be so confident in me that you will be found to be at rest when the storm comes. In summary, the Lord is saying, I want you to attain peace that is beyond understanding. Because let me tell you something, the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Every time the disciples lost their peace and they were troubled, Jesus would say the same thing to them. He never said, oh, you who have no peace. No. He always said to them, oh, you of no faith. We've established that it was the King James translators who said little faith because Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy where Moses heard God say, oh, you faithless generation, oh, you wicked and perverse generation, how is it that you have no faith? So if you look at your Bible closely and you look at the original translation, the word translated little actually means none. Because some people be patting themselves on the back and say, but at least I have a little faith. Jesus says, even if that faith is as small as a mustard seed, it will move mountain. If your faith is not working, it's not little, it's non-existent. Because we claim to have faith. But the question is, in what? In whom? If your faith is in his name, you will have peace. To not have peace is indicative of not having faith. To not have faith is simple. It only means you have not yet had a revelation of his name. The moment you have a revelation of his name as the prince of peace, and you know that he is your peace, no matter what happens when the test is set, you will not be moved. The test looks the same. It will come in the form of turbulence. The wind will come into the world. And the angels of the Lord are observing to see the people that will panic and the ones that will sleep. That is how the separation is going to be made. When Jesus was on the boat, he told his disciples, let us go to the other side. And to get to the other side, the storm had to come so that we can know the people who were ready for the other side and the ones who were not. The ones who were not ready showed fear, but the ones who was ready was at peace. I told you the only reason why the disciples could not have spoken peace was because they had none. What you have is what you give. So when the oceans were troubled, the disciples could not give anything but add to the panic. But when you have peace, when there's trouble around you, you will speak and there will be peace from within you 
to your situation. I'm going to read to us four, four verses very quickly from the book of Ezekiel chapter 37. We're going to break bread and I will summarize Revelation chapter 3 verse 8 to 10. So Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel. Thirty-seven. We're going to read four verses very quickly. I want you to say. I want you to think about this before saying it, because you need to be sure that you believe it. You see, Jesus says, "Whosoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him." So. Think about who you love. Do you love the world or do you love the Father? It's very simple. One of the ways by which you can tell whether you love God or you love the things of the world is if everything that you have in the world, including your positions and your titles, if they were taken away from you in an instant, what will you do? Will you jump up and down? Or will you just say, blessed be the name of the Lord? If you cannot say, blessed be the name of the Lord, then that means you are still in an unhealthy relationship with the world. Thank you, Cody. I appreciate that. Ezekiel 37, we're going to start from verse 14. It says in Ezekiel 37 verse 14, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Ezekiel here was quoting Enoch. Okay, for people who still don't pay attention to what things Enoch said, at least you have pieces of it all over the place. So this is one of them. Because Enoch was the one that says, when I saw the elect one, when I saw the righteous one, when I saw the one who has been sent by the Lord of all spirits, he came to men and he gave to them of his spirit and he put his wisdom into them and they became anew in the land that he gave to them. And so when you look at it here, what does it say? It says, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. What is your own land? The earth. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. So every single person who told us that we just need to be good, die and go to heaven forevermore lied to us. Because that's not what the word of God says. The word of God says we shall inherit the earth. Of course, the earth is going to be made new, but it is still going to be called the earth. Verse 2. The Bible says, Then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were dry. You know, the fear that many of us have and the reason why Satan gets us to worry about the things of the world as much as we do is because we don't want to be dry. Let me say this again. Many of us don't want to be dry. We don't want to be without the things of the world. We do not want to be without what everybody else has. And that is the reason why rather than making sacrifices to pursue the things of righteousness, we put the things of righteousness on hold to pursue the things of the world. Because you do not want to not have what the Joneses have. Remember, this is the generation that serves God and money. God, G-A-D, money, M-O-N-I. Those were gods of materialism in the Bible. Everybody just wants the next thing. They want the next thing. Do you know that there are people that God has called 
to serve humanity, to serve their brothers and sisters in the household of faith. But they said to the Lord, I need that one more degree. I just I mean, because I've seen these people, they have two masters. This one has a PhD. Oh, I need to go get me one of those. Let me tell you something. If you need it, God will lead you to get it. But don't get it because you think you need it to do what is calling you to do. We don't want to be dry. We don't want to be without. But let me tell you something. If you are dry and God needs you to be swimming in water, it will make it available. Let's not be afraid of losses, of material things. Because the sufficiency of our lives does not consist in the abundance of the things we own. If the things that I own do not determine how sufficient I am before my Heavenly Father, then how can the things that I lose diminish me in the face of the Almighty? When everything that Job had was taken away from him, what did he say? He says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we saw that in heaven, God was still boasting of him, even though he had nothing material. Because he had what was greater than all things. He had the name of God upon his mouth. His wife looked at him and said, deny that name, curse that name and die. And it was like, even if he slays me, I wouldn't do that. How many of us can say that? That even if everything gets taken away, as long as there is that continual response and dependency in my heart upon his goodness, I'm fine. I'm about to speak more plainly after these four verses. So if you're waiting for that, keep waiting. It's about to happen. Verse 3 and then verse 7. Verse 3 says, And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. Somebody said, that's where I want to be. I want to be in a place wherein even if I don't know, I am confident that God knows. You know what that is called in the dictionary of truth is called trust. You trust God to the point wherein if someone is asking you, how are you going to pay that next month's mortgage? You will say, Lord, you know. No, because sometimes we think we know everything. Until we're faced with things that are completely beyond us. You know, the other day we were counseling someone and the person was completely frustrated that their faith was not able to rescue them from their immigration troubles. And I'm like, you have a long way to go. I didn't say it out loud because sometimes as a pastor, I, I have to be nice, I think. I didn't say it loud, but I was thinking within myself. You do not even have faith. As little as it might be, I, I know you. You do not even have faith for the relationship you have with your business partner because every time you come here, you complain about them. You don't have faith enough for favor with the people you do business with and now you want to have faith to overcome the principality of the land that is trying to keep you out of these boundaries. I'm like, that is not how it works. You need to, first of all, be tested in the literal before you are given the march. Many of us have not developed ourselves in the area of trusting God for a safe passage from your home to the office. And now you, you just suddenly want to have faith to go and take down the principality of Lawrenceville. We'll be here when you're tired to offer you some water. The man of God says, I don't know, but you know. Trust God enough to just say, Father, I'm going with what you are going with. Whatever you say, Lord. Verse 7 says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. Let me pause there for a moment. I know that our time is fast spent, but we had a party today, so if we don't finish in time, we've had a good time. The man of God says, when the Lord asked him, he decided not to make up an opinion of his own. He yielded his position to God and says, God, I am saying nothing of my own. I want to hear what you have to say. And guess what happened afterwards? He became a prophet. He was prophesying. You see, because when you decommission your own position, the Lord will take his place in you. 
He says, I prophesied as I was commanded. The reason why many of us are not able to prophesy is because we're lecturing God and we continue to advise God on how he needs to be God. We say things like, God, if you don't give me this job, I won't go to church anymore. As if God does not know the things that you need. Jesus told his disciples and a cross section of fishermen, he says your heavenly father knows the things that you have need of even before you ask. We need to get to the point where we know that the Lord knows. He knows the current interest rate. He knows how you have been cheated on that job. He knows exactly what is going on, but he wants you to admit to him that he knows and you don't. Because only the people that have given up their position will receive the unction to speak as an oracle of God. Many a times you stand in the mirror and you want to counsel yourself because you have just watched some motivational videos on Instagram and you keep telling yourself, you can do this. You are this and you are that. At the end of the day, you can spit into your mirror and do that all night. The Bible says there is nothing you get out of the eloquence of men's wisdom. You have to come at it in the demonstration of power. And so I tell you what, no matter what it is, we need to learn how to retire our own position. I say, God, I ain't got this. You do. The reason, like I told you, I'm going to, after this last scripture, I will spell things out for you. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together. Bone to bone. So this is where I begin to spell things out to you. This is kind of like a continuation of where we left off on Tuesday. It is my mission to warn you of things to come because it is my place as a watchman upon the tower to be able to notify you of that which is ahead that you may not see. Not because I have extra vigilant eyes, but because the Lord has put me in the position of being a watchman. He put me in a vantage position and he shows me things for your sake. The things that I see, I do not see for my own aggrandizement. I do not see so that I can make t-shirts and so that you can buy them. I see them so that you can be equipped and then, and then I can be commended as a faithful servant. Because at the end of the day, the highest commendation that any one of us can get is that of a servant. Come into the rest of your Lord, you good and faithful servant. God, did, Jesus did not say you were going to be commended for being uh, the Lord of the Rings or the champion of mandates. no. You are a servant. And so this is my service to you today to let you know that the wind that is coming is not to blow you away, but to put you together. Bone refers to your spiritual stamina. This army that was in the valley of dry bones, I believe it was originally the tribe of Ephraim. Because when they were in Egypt, they could no longer wait for God. You find that account in the book of Yasha. There was a tribe of Israel, I believe it was the Ephraimites. After a while, they could no longer wait for the salvation of God. And they trained the entire tribe to be soldiers. And they tried to fight against Pharaoh in their own ability. And the Bible says that Pharaoh and his cohorts pursued them outside of the camp of the people. And they killed every single one of them. And it was a mighty blow. And where they were buried, they swept all of their bones into a valley. I believe very strongly that they are the ones that God came to in this place. Because this army, these bones were not just bones. They were already an army. Because when they stood, they were called an army. They were not told to go to training. They were not told, uh, it, it was not said that now maybe we can make them an army. No, what they were originally was what they became because what they experienced was the resurrection power. You do not resurrect Adi and then he becomes Rosemary. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, he was Lazarus. So when you raise an army from the dead, so if they were not an army, if they were just market women, when they were raised from the dead, they would still be market women. They'd have to go to school. Just in case you're, you're debating within yourself, are they really an army? No, they were an army. And they just needed to be put back together again. So here is my submission to you. A wind is coming upon the earth. 
And when this wind comes upon the earth, it's going to be boisterous, it's going to be terrifying, it's going to scare so many people, and people will shout the names of the financial institutions holding their names. People will shout the names of the politicians who promised them that there will be peace and safety. People will call all kinds of names and they will blame all kinds of people. But in that day when they're saying there's a casting down, you must not join them. You must say there is a lifting up. In that day, you must call upon the name of God and say, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because there is nothing that we have that we have not received from above. I tell you this because I have seen that wind and it is a wind that comes and laps the plenty of men. It is a wind that comes and destroys the harvest of many. But it is the same same wind that has come to put your bones together again because your bone in here represents your spiritual stamina. Remember when Jesus was alive before he went to the cross? He was described as flesh and blood because himself he says, this is my body and this is my blood. But when he was raised from the dead, after he had bled out his blood, the ones who encountered him, what did they say? They said, Flesh and bones. Simply because after resurrection, there is a transformation. And for that transformation to happen, there needs to be the mighty wind. That's what we're longing for. We're longing to have a time wherein that which powers us is the wind of heaven, not blood. You see, when blood is still powering you, you're like a combustion engine. You need to keep generating your power as you go. But when you're powered by the wind of heaven, you are eternal. Never tired. Never hungry. Always full of the Holy Ghost. That is where we need to be. It is so desirable, like the, like the singer said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to get there. You see, we want the power, but we do not want to go through the wind. They wanted to go to the other side, but they did not want the storm. But the reality of it is there is no other side without the wind of change, but to you, you will not be tormented because you are confident in his love. Let me tell you something. This is what the Lord said to me, and I will just say to you like I heard it. He said, the wind has been instructed to touch everything that you have ever touched. Everything that you and I have ever touched will be touched by the wind because it is the promise of God to you to have your works tested. The entire world is being tested because God is fair. He makes it to rain upon the good and upon the, upon the wicked. And so the Bible says, and we just read it, that everyone is being tested. Revelation chapter 3 verse 10, the whole world is being tested. But the good news for you and I is that we can emerge from this test victorious if we learn to not hold on to anything but his name. And so this is the part of it that some of us may not find as fun. But we're going to have to, if I let me read it to you from scripture so you will not say that it is me. Come with me to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. And we're just going to quickly read. I'll see if we can keep it to just one verse of scripture. Read with me from verse 14. Deuteronomy 28, verse 14. Aren't you lucky we're reading just one because there are 68 or so verses in that Deuteronomy 28. Verse 14 says, So you shall not turn aside from any of these words which I command you this day, to the right or to the left, or go after other gods to serve them. What did I read? Yeah, 28, 14. What did I say? Okay. All right. I just wanted to be sure because Sheila is a scholar. So if she calls anything out, we have to pay attention. <laughs> Let me tell you something. This thing, this is where you know God's people from God's people. People who are always going after things and the people who go after God. You see, <clears throat> let's read it again. He says, so you shall not turn aside. Like I said, this is where some of us may not be too happy, but the reality of it is that God is saying that no matter what happens, 
keep the faith. Keep his word. You see, every time there is an exodus, some people will turn aside and they will perish. Remember the wife of Lot. What was she told? She was told not to turn around to look. But the Bible says that because of their belongings, because their belongings were much, she had to check on it one more time. I'm going to close with this little vision. It's not a little vision, it's a good vision, but I'm going to close with this. We have been tested with the little things first, one after the other. I see so many caps, like little caps. They look like, um, like, what do you call those? Like chips when you go to a casino. You know those little chips? They're like plastic coins. I saw several of them. On the back of them, they seem the same. But as little children, they were being pointed out to us to flip them over. And if you got the wrong one, you were told to get up and leave. So every time you had to be precise. And when I saw that test, I was like, yeah, this is easy. For some reason in the vision, I felt like I, like I knew what was going on, that it was easy. And as we were being tested, some were told to leave. And I thought, wait, wait a minute. I thought that person knew how to identify. And then it was said to me that it is not what they know. It is what controlled their hand. Every one of those child, every one of the children that got it correct, their hand was connected to a stick that moved them to choose the right thing. You know why? Because they did not know what the Lord knew. Ezekiel says, Lord, I don't know, but you know. Thinking that you know is leaning on your own understanding and every child that was in that examination room that chose, interestingly, they looked like the impression of Egyptian children with the white garment and with only half a head of hair. But they were God's children. So do with that what you will. And as they were being tested, the ones who made their choice because of what they thought, who did not wait for the nudging of the stick that was connected to their elbow, they failed and they were told to leave. But the ones who made the right choice every time, I was given an opportunity to see from the side, but there was a stick that was connected to their hand that allowed them to flip the coin correctly every time. In case you're wondering, every time they flipped the coin, it was creating the image of an oasis. So when they flip it, it could be water. When they flip it, flip it sometimes, it could be palm trees. When they flip it, it could be a tent or velvet. When they flip it, 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 it just thinks of paradise was what they were unveiling. But the ones who unveiled the fire and the ones who unveiled the warm were told to leave. I want us to get this picture because there is something in this image that can recalibrate the way we see the times that we're in. So let's start all over again. A set of children were lined up, all dressed the same, looking the same. There were coins in front of them that looked like casino chips. On the back of them, they had the same markings. They all looked the same. But when they were told to flip it, the ones who flipped open the worm and the flame were told to leave. Only the ones who opened life, oasis, water, rest, they were the ones who made it to the next test. There is a next test. I'll see if I can describe that to you also. And then the Lord showed me by the ministry of his angel who positioned me on the side and I saw that those children had the stick that was connected to their hand. That stick, the moment I saw it, no one had to tell me. I knew it was the rod of correction. The people who have learned to depend on the leading of the Holy Spirit, the ones who did not despise the chastening of the Lord, they have the rod of God's correction fastened to their arm, showing them where to go. The word of God says, whether you turn to the left or to the right, you will hear a voice telling you, this is the way. You cannot lean on your understanding in the times that we're, that we're in. People will tell you, sell the stock, buy that one. People will tell you, buy this one, sell that one. Do not lean on your own understanding. Only do things by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Test number one, little things. Test number two, maybe not, the, not, not number two, but the next test, because there were several steps. The next step, they were lined up on the edge of a pavilion and they were told to jump down. And the ones who jumped down without the leading of the stick, 
of the rod of God's correction. This time around, they looked like wooden gears. And I'm going to explain to you because it was revealed also to me what the wooden gears mean. So imagine people standing on a ledge like this. And some of them had their ankles connected to a bigger gear. You know what a gear is with the teeth. And they had the smaller gear and then the bigger gear. Those ones, when they fell, they did not perish. Because as soon as they went on their faces, the gear picked them back up again. They stood again. But the ones who were not connected, they fell on their faces. And that was the end of them. They broke down like ceramic dolls. So let me explain to you what the gears are. The gears represent dependency on God. Those who have learned to depend on God every step of the way. Those who know that yes, they can give their child Tylenol when the child has a headache, but still choose to pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the ones who have latched their small gear to his big gear. It is my mission to be of help today. Do not see me as a burden, but see the word of the Lord as help. You see, I tell you what, they, when they had an opportunity to put their hands in their pocket and give money to somebody and say, well, that person is in need. I want to, even though they had what it took, they still prayed and said, Lord, is this what you are leading? The ones who have practiced dependence on God, when this wind comes, even when everybody falls, they will bounce up again because that machine called the grace and the power of God is with them. They have a relationship. They have a connection. I'm going to stop at those two tests. I saw other tests. I saw the test of the race. I saw the test of the crimson. But the Lord revealed to you what tests you need to see. But when you take those two tests that I have shown to you, that I've shared with you, they focus on number one thing, you have to be led by the Spirit. You must not take your leading from the flesh. Your flesh will be telling you, this is what you need to do. You need to tell your flesh, I'm a son of God. I am led by the Spirit, not by my flesh. And then the other one has to do with not being self-confident. Not being confident in your own ability, but being confident in the grace of God. Even when you have what it takes, you still tell him that, Lord, what will you have me do. Lord, before I was here and before I had this, you kept me. And now that I have this, I still need to trust in you rather than in the things that I have. The reason why those two things are important is because of this scripture here. He says, do not turn to the right or to the left or go after other gods. If you trust in your own understanding, you become a God unto yourself. If you trust in the counsel of those who are perishing, they become a God unto you. The wind that is coming to the world, there will be physical winds, which the Holy Spirit reminded me that Jesus said that there will be physical winds, there will be all kinds of turbulence in the natural, the weather will be unfriendly, but that's not your problem. That weather that is unfriendly is just to let you know that the same things are happening in the realm of the Spirit. Because on the visible elements of this world, we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God and of eternity. And so when you see the weather, Jesus says, when you see these things, lift up your face for your Redeemer is near. Your redemption is near. I'm going to wrap up as we break bread with that verse of scripture from Ezekiel. That verse of scripture from Ezekiel chapter 37 that we just read, verse 7. Ezekiel 37, verse 7. Let's just quickly read that together again. And that is what we're going to break bread with. Ezekiel 37, verse 7. Do we have it on the screen? It says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together. The little children that were sitting for that test, they chose as they were commanded, as they were led. That is the reason why it was the first test 
Because it wasn't until after that one that the rattling began. The Lord is giving you an opportunity, you and I, in the next couple of days, in the coming days and weeks, maybe months, to make the right choices by choosing to be led of the Holy Spirit. I say this again and I say this very slowly. You see, when Diana came today and she was like, I woke up this morning and I knew I needed to be here. I smiled because you came here for a sign today that it might be known to all that this is the response of each of our hearts in the season that we are in to go where the Lord leads, even if it's not where you normally go, even if it's not what you normally do. But you do it because he says so. Just because he says so. You know why? God is looking for people that will trust him. And the outcome of that is very simple. Ah, do I have time to describe this to you? Yes, I do, and I will describe it. You see, this place that I went into, I'm still there as I speak to you because every time that I receive a word concerning that vision, I find myself in that same place. I can smell an aroma in that room where the little children are. When I asked the angel of the Lord who was my guide in the vision, who is, because I'm still there in the vision, I said, what is this aroma? He said, it is actually the fragrance of manna. He said, because after the test, they shall be fed. Be okay with the, chast with the chastening of the Lord. When the Bible says the whole world is going to be tested, God is not going to test you and then afterwards abandon you. He will replenish you. When Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tested of the devil, after the temptation, he says, get thee behind me, O Satan, which means he decided that the test was over. Because it's the beginning and the end. He says, that's it. I'm not doing any tests anymore for today. The Bible says the angels of the Lord came and they ministered to him. So when you hear tests, don't be afraid. The Lord already has prepared manna to feed you after the test. So I say this to you because like I said, I, was still, I am still there. When the man of God, Ezekiel, says, I prophesy, they showed me the component of prophecy in this classroom. And you know what it was? It looked like an engine made out of bones, and it was in the mouth of these children. And the engine was producing the word of God. It was producing sounds. Hmm. Somebody say noise canceling. You know that we are in a generation where we have noise canceling headsets. You know how they work? For the people who didn't do physics in high school, let me tell you how they work. You see, noise canceling headsets, they have a microphone that has an accelerated processor, which means it processes faster than the, than the earpiece. So what you hear is running through a normal pace processor, but the microphone is accelerated. So what it means is that it will hear what sounds are around you, the microphone will pick it up, and then it will create the opposite sound to cancel it out. That is how noise canceling headsets work which is what the Bible says, be swift to hear, but slow to speak. So this noise canceling process is required by every single one of us because the noise that is coming into the world, if you do not have the neutralizer, it, will, it can drown you. That is the reason why the Lord says to Ezekiel, I don't want you to just hear the sound of the wind and be there. Shaking. As the noise is coming, in fact, before it begins, start prophesying. So that you can cancel the noise for your own sake. The Lord will show you what to say after you have done what he says. When you do that which the Lord commands, you will prophesy to your situation. And when the noise comes into the world to join your bones together, you will not be tormented by the noise or the rattling because at the end of the day, your focus will not be on the suturing of your bones together. I will prophesy when the wind comes. And I will begin to speak even before the rattling. So as we break bread today, this is what I want you to latch onto. The man of God, Ezekiel, says, I prophesied as I was commanded. And then the rattling came. I want you to say, Lord, as I partake of the body of Jesus today and drink of his blood, 
Let me speak as Jesus spoke. Let me speak as the apostles spoke. The Bible says the holy men of old, they spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Justin, after the service, please come see me. The Holy Spirit spoke through this man. Because you do not know what to say. You do not know the sound that is required to cancel the noise. And that is the reason why you need to rely on the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. I will be a remembrance of the existence of Jesus. When I speak, it will be as Jesus spoke, spirit and life, because I will speak by the Holy Spirit. I will not complain, I will not murmur. I will not speak death, but I will speak life. I will not speak and shout like a helpless man. I will sing for joy as one who has already been helped by God. I want you to begin to press into these things because the equipping that you need has been brought to you so that you, not only are you without excuse, but so that you haven't been strengthened can go and strengthen others. Let me say this to you, Christian parents. You see that word was for you. That as you have been strengthened, go and strengthen others. You see those people that you were thinking about when the message was going on? You need to let them hear it. They need to hear what you have heard. That they may know that this is not the time to rely in long-term strategy. This is not the time to rely only on the options that are available for your future and for your safety. These are the times to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying unto the churches and to do unconventional things that others may question, but the Lord will approve. Because at the end of the day, you will hear a voice saying to you, this is the way, walk in it. You see, the Lord has also positioned you, Laura, as a voice in the ears of those who, have become, who are so comfortable to operate based on their own understanding. They are people of analysis and, and research. They are people of calculated execution. But the Lord has positioned you that you might be able to whisper to them that which is the mind of the Lord. It might shake them to their foundation, but it is of great privilege to them to heed that which the Lord is saying through you. Don't be afraid to be that voice. To them, you might be but a little girl. But let me tell you something. Sometimes it is that same little girl that the Lord uses to announce his deliverance. So stand your ground. Stand by the Lord and let him speak through you. As we go on forth today, go forth today before we break bread, I want to pray for a group of people. You are saying, Lord, it's been a while since I last saw, since I last heard, since I last had an encounter, and you are asking, oh, Lord, how much longer? The Lord has a response for you, but I'm only, I'm only going to tell the people who come here. So if you are that person and you're saying, Lord, it's been a while. You used to be a dreamer. God has revealed things to you in the past, but you seem to have gone through a dry spell. It happens, and there's a reason why. It is not because of your negligence, but it is because you had to go through a passage for his namesake. I want to pray for you real quick. If those dreams have dried up, if the encounters have become quite few and far in between, I want, to, I want you to come. You see, because there, there, are, there is a key that has been given to me. I'm not sure if you were paying attention a couple of weeks ago. Alan said, man of God, I saw you being given a key. And with that key, you open doors to people. I have chosen by the grace of God today, I said, as I am commanded to open doors of visitation and encounters for people. You see, don't shortchange yourself. Don't say you're going to corner me after service. I'm going to put the key back in my pocket after this meeting, after this place. So if you are saying, I, I haven't seen in a while. I haven't had a dream that I know this is a message from God in a while. You know, come, I want to be a blessing to you today. You see, freely have I received, I want, received, and I want to freely give to you today. But I can only also give as the Lord has commanded. I'm going to start calling people. I'm going to start calling people. <laughs> Father, in the matter name of Jesus, I thank you because of your fullness have we received grace for grace. Thank you, Father, for the key of David. 
Thank you for the key that opens doors of revelation, of insight. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, in fact, this kind goeth not, but by the anointing. We're going to be praying in the spirit. Alan, get me the oil. Let's just pray in the spirit. Let's just give God thanks. We're not while in the wait time, but we are just pressing into what the Lord has for us. And in case you're wondering, it's not, is the time is still, we still have time. So just pray where you're at. Pray, pray, pray. This is not the time to escape the room. This is the time to get into the presence of God. Father, we have confidence. Alrighty, so let us take the body of Jesus and the, and the blood represented here by the bread and the wine. If you left yours in your seat, you can grab it or wait till later. The choice is yours. But the rest of us, we're going to break bread right now real quick. And there is, a, there, is a, there is an opportunity. One is with us today and stands with a trumpet. And he blows the trumpet. And as he blows the trumpet, it became a sound wave in the room. And he says, let him who has need take hold of help. So if you are in the room and you need help, say, Lord, help me. You see, the Bible says God speaking, God himself. He says, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast away. Archbishop Benson says, God never turns back anybody who says, Lord, help me. I need you, Lord, more than yesterday. I need you, Lord, more than words can say. I need you, Lord, now than before. I need you, Lord, I need you, Lord. I want you to say, Lord, I need your help. And someone just needs to say, Lord, you know. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. This is unto surrender. This is unto prophecy. This is your noise canceling effect by the hand of God. You may eat and drink. So, thank you, Lord Jesus. You see, the Bible says, that we need to cut certain things short in righteousness. And we can only do that effectively by the Holy Spirit. You see all of you standing in here, as we were breaking bread and we were done with it, the Lord said to me, he says they need to shut the previous door behind them and the new one will open. There are doors that you need to shut behind you and, and, and the new ones will open. And so, please, start coming from here. Once, once I touch you, you can go back to your seat. You see, because there is the the place of the laying on of hands, where is the oil? I would need help. I would need, okay, hallelujah. Maybe somebody can come up here. Alan, can you come up here? No, no, you stay there because you're a big man. You can, you can help me hold anybody that needs to be held. Hallelujah. There you go. So please hold the microphone for me. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you, for sending me here for such a time as this. Lord, in Jesus' name, this woman will see as she is seen. Your eyes are all over her because your eye runs to and fro upon the earth, seeking for the one whose mind is stayed on you. Let that door shut behind you and let a new one open. You see, you will begin to see through the window. Don't stop there. You will catch glimpses all through the day. Don't stop there. This is for all of you. But I tell you specifically, wait until the door opens. And not only will you see visions, but you will walk into trances in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for the desire of this one to walk in the prophetic. Your word says to desire the best gifts, especially the gifts of prophecy. Don't worry, woman. You will speak the mind of God with clarity in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. For this woman of God, I thank you for the things. So, Lord, the Lord says, Hallelujah. He says, you no longer have to worry about the ones you asked for when you didn't know. 
Because the days of ignorance, the Lord has winked at. That is the door that you're shutting behind you. But the ones you ask for now that you know, they are granted unto you seven doors deep in the mighty name of Jesus. They are granted unto you seven doors deep in Jesus' name. Father, I give you praise. Thank you for Charles. He has already sought you in confession. Now seek the Lord in repentance. You have confessed, having shut down the gift. But now you just need to have a change of heart so that you can use the gift again. It was never taken from you. You were just locked out of it. But now I open it unto you because the word of God said concerning me that I have been given authority by the favor that I found with the Son of Man, who is the man of Galilee, that to whom I forgive, they have forgiveness. He says, I've given you authority, whosoever you forgive is forgiven. You are forgiven now in true repentance. Walk in your gift because Jesus already paid the price. Love him, appreciate him, give him thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this man. Uh, in fact, the ones that you thought you saw that you would want to see again, the Lord is saying, just forget all those ones. You haven't even gotten started. So for you, it's going to be new insight and revelation in the matter name of Jesus. Oh, yes. Let me tell you something. The Lord says to pay attention to your children. As you watch them, you will see things concerning them that will be overlapping dimensions. You will see different realms come together in your living room. It's just to get your attention. And once you recognize those things, then look up. The heavens will be open above you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I give you praise. Thank you for this woman. So you've been asking for the Lord to show you how to help them. The Lord says, ask me the help that you need. Because once you get to where you need to be, you will see clearly how to help them in the mighty name of Jesus. You understand what I just said? You see, there is work that is being done in you. And the Lord wants to give you insight into that work. And that new elevated position in Christ would allow for you to know very clearly how to help them. You have carried the burden to help them for so long. But the Lord is saying, this season, I want you to pay attention to what I am doing in you. And then you can get to the place of what you need to do for them in the mighty name of Jesus. So let, let him just reveal to you what he's doing in you. One of the things that you will see will cause you to be broken down before the Lord in tears of joy. And you will say, Lord, I didn't even know. And he will say, yes, but I know. The Lord knows. God bless you. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, every pain of heartbreak and disappointments that you have experienced in this coming season will begin to work for your good because now there is room in your heart for the grace, for the anointing, for virtues. You will be a reservoir of virtues, shooting out virtues in multiple directions in days to come. So rejoice in the Lord because your peace, you are about to start to abound in glorious peace, like serious peace. You will just, you will be at so much peace, it will feel intoxicating in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise in Jesus' name. Thank you for this woman and thank you for the hunger and thirst. Anna, Anna, it's time for you to be filled because you have hungered and thirsted after righteousness. It is time for you to be filled. You'll be filled in the morning. You'll be filled in the night. You will fill, you'll be filled. You see, I see you standing by the porch, by the window, like you're looking out through the window of a glorious place. And I heard that that which is outside is being brought to you. You will be filled in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. Have I prayed for everybody? Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Give me your hand. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you because this one has received the holy commendation. May she walk more in that which she has excelled in. In this season, from you, many will learn what is truly going on in the world. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord will deliver true news through you. You heard what I said? Not fake news, but true news of what is happening in the world will be delivered through you. In the mighty name of Jesus, beloved of God, beloved of God, beloved of God, it is your season of revelation, of insight into what it means to be God's beloved. Let me tell you something, you will experience the love of God and it's going to be like a blanket that wraps around you, bringing safety, bringing peace, bringing you confidence, and above all, bringing you comfort in the mighty name of Jesus. You know, Jesus said, 
I will give her rest. You have labored and you have been heavy laden. He will give you rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. By the name of Jesus, as this man stands in the gap for his wife, I pour upon him, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this oil of the anointing for a restoration of joy. Yeah, a restoration of joy. Joy unspeakable. A restoration of joy. Waking up in the middle of the night to sing in the spirit. Falling asleep because you have just been praying so much in the spirit. That kind of joy. That revival, that refining, that refiring. In the name of Jesus, amen. Praise God. Alrighty, God is good. So we're going to wrap it up very quickly. If I've called your name and I've asked you to stay, make sure you stay. And for the rest of us, before Alan comes to receive the offering and to give thanks uh, for the offerings and donations that are brought. Oh, okay. Praise God. I want to just say this very quickly. I want you to pay attention to the things that have been said in here. But don't forget, whatever you do, don't assume that you know. Don't try to impress God. Just ask him. I said, Lord, what do I do in this situation? What does this mean? He's closer to you now than ever before. Make use of that. Ask him. Speak to him. God bless you in Jesus' name. Alan. Hallelujah. God is good. We'll have the offering details on the screen there. In just a bit, what a night tonight, y'all. God is good. The given details there on the screen. Dollar sign, Communion House at Cash App. Um, at Communion House for PayPal, as well as the Zelle information there in the P.O. Box. If you'd like an envelope here with our dear brother, Kenyatta. And we'll wait a few seconds to prepare our offerings. Hallelujah. And as we're preparing offering, a scripture for us from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall man up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Father, we give you praise for this night of meeting for an express word. How you have equipped us and truly reveal to your sons, the prophets, what you do, O oh God. And we say we don't take it lightly. We count it as a privilege, as an honor. Lord, as you have found favor in us in Jesus Christ and have sent your only begotten son in our behalf, O oh God, that this moment, this hour, Lord, you reveal to us how, Lord, you are revealing yourself. You reveal to us how you are moving in our midst that we may be properly positioned. There is none like you, O oh God. Let these offerings that we give in obedience as we give cheerfully be found pleasing unto you, O oh God. Lord, as we sow into this house, this place of fertile ground, where you bring multiplication, where you bring increase, O oh God, where we have seen fruit, we know that we do this not in vain, O oh God, but bringing glory to your name. There is none like you, O oh God, for we know that you give seed unto the sower. And we declare you before, before you, O oh God, that this is the day that you have made, that we rejoice and are glad in it. And we all say, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the name of the Lord. God is good. Yet another message that we have to watch a couple times this week, just let it get deep down in our spirit because as pastor put it, we've been given the cheat sheet, you see, and we've been granted speed. So we just need to celebrate the Lord for that in this hour. God is good. Don't forget Tuesday, baptisms. If you need to be on that list, let me know. 
Um, and we know the brothers and sisters that will be there uh, up until this point. But again, if that's something you want to partake in, we'll be doing that uh, right before service on Tuesday. That is September 5th. All righty. Everyone have a blessed weekend and we'll see you soon.